we'll just record. Um, all right. So we're doing kinetics. And kinetics, in one word, is rate. Or how fast. So for chemistry, it's all about reactions. So it's the rate of the reaction. So that's why I wore my Tinkerbell outfit. For Janae loves my outfits, but I figured we need some fairy dust to make things go faster because the first question is three things that affect the rate, and one of them is fairy dust. Um, so I usually do a demo, but I'm hoping one of you will do this demo this summer. Um, so there's three things that affect the rate, and um, the rate of the reaction for a chemist has to completely do with the collisions. The more collisions, you need collisions, you need more, and they have to be head on. Um, so the more collisions, the faster the reaction, and the more effective, the harder, effective, harder, um, higher kinetic energy. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at. So the first thing that increases the rate is if you increase the concentration. And that's what a lot of the math we're gonna do tonight is doing this. Um, the lab, we usually do two labs with this, and so you're gonna get the data and just analyze the data, and that's what the sample is over there. But if you increase the concentration, uh, you increase the probability of a collision. I think I spelled. All right, number two is you increase the temperature. So usually I ask you guys, what do you think will increase it? But um, so temperature, sure. So as you increase the temperature, you have uh, higher, more jiggles. So you increase the jiggles, you increase the kinetic energy. So you're gonna get more collisions. So increasing the number of collisions and how effective they are. Um, so they're going to be more frequent and more effective because they're going to be hitting harder. So think of it like if you are in a, um, right, we, still, we started going back to the grocery store again. So when you're in the, if a shopping cart hit your car in the grocery store parking lot, you, you probably wouldn't even see a dent because there wouldn't be, it wouldn't be going very fast. But if we can get something, they, everything excited and moving fast, so if you're on the interstate and you're going 65 miles per hour and you're in a collision, you're gonna cause some serious damage. And so that's why temperature. The general rule, which is for every 10 degrees Celsius increase, you double the rate. You don't need to know that but that's usually the number they say. Now, this is really interesting because I'm a biochemist. Um, there is a point in biochemistry where you keep increasing the rate, it goes faster, and then it just drops off. Uh, and you guys did that when you made the cheese in lab. Um, and so what happens here is if you get to, our body temperature is 37, and so this is why we get a fever when we're sick, if you get to too high of a temperature, um, you would denature. It falls apart. I don't know if you remember the lab, but it all jiggles apart and comes apart. So you had to heat up the milk and then you added an acid to help even more. All right, and then the third thing is a catalyst. And that's what fairy dust is. Um, and there really is no comparison to a catalyst. A catalyst makes it go millions or a billion times faster. Our body is filled with catalysts. Um, they're called enzymes. So to a biochemist, an enzyme is a catalyst. And it allows our reactions in our body, in our cells, to happen in a time frame um, that we work, if you believe in time and all that. But these are the three ways you can increase a reaction. Tonight, we're gonna mostly spend looking at the first one, concentration, and doing the math with it. Um, I think the very last thing, I, I introduced some of the temperature calculations. Um, 
And then on Thursday, we'll go back through them because we'll also look at a catalyst and the mechanism of reaction. Um, but that's what kinetics is, is it's held fast. And this is really the whole thing summarized in, in that. All right, so I'm gonna get my squid and erase that. You guys would ask me questions if you got a question. So that's the problem on the next page. I first started out with um, the example on this page where it just has HI. So hi, how's it going? And it has it in brackets. Those brackets mean concentration, meaning molarity. So the molarity um, is the concentration unless you're told otherwise. And so that's just a shorthand way. And then the little I just means, you can see there's a little I there. That just means the initial molarity. So it's kind of a cool little way that um, scientists will make their chart. And saying if you start out with 0.1 molar, it's like if you guys did the lab, you would make this beautiful chart. We double it and we triple it. So that's what, in lab, you had three different things, like in that chart, and you doubled one thing at a time. And so the rate is, in chemistry terms, uh, rather than miles per hour, we do it as concentration per time. So molarity per second, um, or molarity per hour, or molarity per minute. Um, you will see me sometimes write it like that with the capital M, and sometimes as moles per liter second. Um, and the book actually, the book that I posted, I don't know if anybody looks at it, uh, they do a really good job. And this is the hardest piece students ever have with kinetics is the units because they're funky units. It's like, what's a mole per liter second? I, you know, what, what do any of these units mean? All right, if we have a rate of 20, and I double the concentration, it makes sense. I have double the amount of collisions, so my rate doubles. Um, so if you double the concentration and your rate doubles, so it's the same, this is called first order. I don't know who came up with this term, but that's what it's called. It's called a first order reaction. And it's, it's the most common one, by far, like really common. Um, it is not the only way that you will see it, but if we tripled it, which the next step shows, it triples the rate. Um, the last lecture next week, if for those of you who look at the book, we suddenly go out of order. Nuclear decay, so we're gonna look at nuclear chemistry. Um, nuclear decay is always first order, and so nuclear decay is pretty cool. Um, so we come back and we look at nuclear chemistry, so half of next week's lecture we actually cover this week. Um, so that's why there's only one lecture next week. And then it says, oh, um, so how we would write the rate law, let's erase this, uh, is this was the concentration of HI. So a rate law is always written as rate equals, and it's always lowercase k. And then you put the concentration in the brackets of the reactants. So this has to be your reactants. Um, and so my reaction was up there on the top of the page, 2HI decaying to hydrogen plus iodine. All right. Um, and then this would be to the first order. That's the one there. And you'll get used to this. So you kinda, this is the nice part. None of you can talk back to me because usually everybody's like, what is that? I don't get it. Um, it's, it's a one. If it was second order, it would be a two. If it was third order, it would be a three. Uh, but it is not the stoichiometry. You have to do an experiment to figure out what it is. Um, so it's not the stoichiometry because the stoichiometry would have been a two. So I think I have that comment in the notes. 
And once again, if you're having trouble sleeping, read this chapter. I really have never made it past the first few pages. Uh, and then the other thing it said I wanted to do here was to show you an energy diagram. And a couple of you came from different teachers than me. So you may have seen these in another class, but we're gonna do more with them, I'm pretty sure on Thursday, the second half of the lecture. So the, the x-axis is the reaction, and the y-axis would be energy. Uh, you may have done these when you did thermodynamics in 221. And this would be my reactants. So in this case, the two HI. So we'll go ahead and write them. And this would be my products, the hydrogen plus the iodine. Uh, I'm going to put a dot. That difference, I'm not connecting the lines yet, the difference between the start and the end, that's your delta H. So you may remember that um, in 221, oh, we talked about a little bit this term. Uh, that's the enthalpy of a reaction. So the thing that's key is in kinetics, somebody actually won the very first, second, third Nobel Prize, one of the first Nobel Prizes in chemistry, was that, that it never goes straight from one to the other. There's always a hump. So this hump is called the activation energy. This is awesome. I just summarized all eight pages in like one part of the board. So we're done, we can all go home. Um, so the hump is the activation energy, and the activation energy is symbolized as a capital E sub A. Um, it's the energy to activate. So the HI can't just break apart on its own. I mean, if it did, it wouldn't even be there. And so you need some energy. We have to put some potential, some kinetic energy into it to get over, to get it started. It's kind of like giving it a push. Um, to get things started. And I'm pretty sure actually I talk about this at the end tonight and then again more on Thursday. Um, but I put it on the first page also because you have more energy at the beginning. So there we go. Questions. One page done. All right. Hopefully it's videotaping and you're not all um, good. I was wondering on. Um is there possibly um, uh, another light in the room that could be turned on or a darker pen? I, I can still see, like everything, I, I, I can still see everything, but it's kind of thing. The problem, I think it's because it's daylight later. Does that work? That probably works much worse. Yeah, not, not, <laughs> not much better. <laughs> Let me see if the, I have another blue pen. Maybe it works better. Is that better? That looks darker. We will see. Oh yeah, I think that's I think that's better. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I think that'll be better. Okay. I don't know that. I'm not convinced it's recording. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Everybody in the class is sending you abundant blessings and fairy dust. All right. So I'm on page 38 for those of you following along at home. And we're gonna look at, for like the next 20 minutes, half hour, that first thing, the concentration effect. Um, and so you have this awesome chart. And they did five sets of experiments. So let's just look at the first two. And the difference between, the first one's like the baseline. So you mix things together and in lab, you stand there and you talk to each other and you shake and you shake and you shake and you wait till the color changes. And half of you would miss it because you'd be so involved in the conversation, but it's an awesome lab. Um, if you notice from the first to the second experiment, only one thing changed and that was column A. Column B and C did not. So you only want one change at a time. And when we doubled A, we then look at the rate and the rate doubled. 
So that's first order. So that's the thing with the order. If you double the concentration and you the rate doubles, that's first order. So first order is if I, again, cut it in half, the rate would go to a half. So we would say A is first order. Um, so when we write our rate law down here, we would say rate equals little k, and then we'd say a to the first power. You can put the one or you can leave it off. Uh, now we have to figure out b. So to do b, we're going to look at, at experiment number three, and we're going to compare two to three. And the reason we're going to compare two to three some of you are probably going to have to stop and look at this. You only want one thing to change. If you compared one to three, both A and B would change. But when we compare two to three, A doesn't change, C doesn't change, only B changed. So from two to three, I cut B to half. And my rate, so this is now one half. My rate actually goes to one quarter. Tinkerbell can do math really fast, or you can put, put that in your calculator. But my rate is now one quarter what it was. So this is not first order, because the change I made to the concentration is not the same as the rate. But if I want one half, to what power would equal one quarter? That's what the order is, is how it affects it. Um, and so we would say it's second order. So B is to the second power. Um, so it has a much bigger influence. Second order is not that common. Um, it's it's kind of hard to, it's, I, I honestly can't um, fathom it, but unless, until we break it down into mechanisms, but um, every, if you doubled it, the rate would go up by fourfold. If you tripled it, the rate would go up by ninefold because it's having a square um, yeah, effect. All right, so now we have to figure out C. So this was second order. And then for C, we're gonna compare the very first one to the very last one. So why I'm comparing, I'm sorry, to the fourth one. A doesn't change, it stayed at point one. B doesn't change, and C doubles. And so this is an interesting one. It is zero order. And that is, no matter what your change is, in this case we doubled the concentration, uh, rate is the same. So if we put it into our equation and write C to the zero power, you guys are all really good at math. Anything to the zero power is just the number one. So that's why it doesn't matter. No matter what you do to C, you still get the same number, one. Um, so it has no effect. So zero order means it has, that reactant has no effect on the rate. No matter what you do to it, it has, it doesn't change the rate. So you can write the rate law like I just did, where you say, you would always say rate equals K, little k, and then you put your reactants, and the reactants are in brackets, raised to the power, that is their order. Now C, because it's zero order, you can just leave it off. And this is our rate law. And that's important because that is now an algebraic expression that we use to solve the rest of this question. So every single chart, we're going to create our own algebraic equation. And that's what this means. So questions. Go ahead, Aaron. You're good? Okay.
Oh, I'm saying I'm, I don't have any questions. Okay. <laughs> but, the rest of you guys are good. So we'll go ahead. And our, is the pen better? We're good with the pen, hopefully. Oh, it's much better. Okay. Yeah, these, you know, it's really weird. I don't know if it's like the change in the weather, but these pens are like running out of ink in one use. Um, I think that's why I like the chalkboard. All right, to solve for K, you just pick one set of data. It doesn't matter which set of data. If your rate law is correct, you will get the same K every time. And that's why this was such an awesome lab, because if you did your math correctly, you all got perfect results. And so then you felt so good about yourself because you were perfect. Um, so I'm just going to use my first set of data, the first line in your chart. So for the rate, 5.4 e to the negative 7, it looks like it's running out. And that was molarity per second equals k is my unknown, so I just put it in. Uh, a is 0.1 molar. And the B was 0.2 molar. And then we have to square that. So you would just do your algebra magic. So you guys can all stop me. And since I'm Tinkerbell, I can just do the magic, rearrange, divide by the 0.1 and the 0.2 squared. And I'm gonna actually do it because there's gonna be a question. Um, as I mentioned, the hardest thing students have with this because it's the algebra is not so bad. We would divide by the 0.1 to move it over, and we would divide by the 0.2 with its units. The hardest thing students have is the units. It's a small piece of it, so don't lose sleep about it. What's gonna happen is this molarity is gonna cancel that molarity, but you still have this molarity squared, which doesn't cancel, and the second, and so the number, we, what's my number? Um, so when we find K, we get 1.4, whatever, E. Sorry, I was looking at the next question. Um, e to the negative four. But my units are gonna be, this is, this M is in the denominator. So you can either say per M squared seconds. Um, which is fine, or the way I wrote it on the answer there is m to the minus two and then seconds to the minus one. So the negative on the unit just means it's in the denominator. Uh, constants, the k is going to have different units depending on the set of data, and the units are always going to be weird. The time is always going to be in the denominator, so per seconds or per minutes, um, so seconds to the minus one. All right, I'm going to skip to E because it's still up here on the board, and I'm actually not going to do it. I'm just going to explain it, that you would go back to this equation, and you would plug this rate in. You would plug this K in, because it is now a constant for all the data that we're working on, and you would plug the A in, and you would solve for B, and you will get my answer. All right, I'm gonna go back and do D though, because I did something on D that I wanted to show you. So you would go back your rate law, and I think, right, rate equals, you don't have to write it again. I didn't give you much space. And we plug in, it says for experiment four, but I think I meant experiment five, because I have a question mark there. And maybe the amount of pins I have will determine this. Let's see if this one is better now. Uh, we're going, we're solving for rate. You would plug in your K. We plug in the A, we plug in B, we square the B, that's molarity. C, we get ignore because it's zero order, and we punch it in and you don't get my answer. Um, 
sorry, I have to think for a second. I think you get half of my answer. I think when you plug this in, you get 4.55, well, two sig figs. So around 4.6 or 4.5 e to the negative seventh. The m squared is going to cancel this m squared. So we're back to the molarity per second. And what I wanted to point out, you can write it like that. Or you can again write it as moles per liter second. If you go back and read the chart, the rate was the rate, and the triangle means change of A, and the little t meant time. So this was the rate of A changing. So this means this is moles of A. And I wanted to know moles of B. So that is when, once you solve for the rate, you can go back up and use my balanced equation that's above the chart. It's under the gnomes up there. And you guys know how to do this. That there was one in the balanced equation, it's the stoichiometry, one mole of A and two moles of B. So I know I just said a few moments ago, you can't use stoichiometry. That is for the order. So that was for step A. The stoichiometry is not the order um, of the reaction. Sometimes it does come out the same, um, but you would punch that in and you would get the answer. That's the 9.1 e to negative 7. All right. So that's moles of me. So that's our first problem. Any questions? Or I have to use my psychic ability and see. Um, Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to let you know, it, it seems like your uh, pen might be uh, <laughs> getting lighter. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have any more. I've gone through like six this week between this class. Oh, I have one. No, that's that one. I know it doesn't work. Um, and we, and I can it, uh, I can make do. Um, well, other people are going to probably have trouble too. We'll just keep going. You can see enough right now. Mm hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. Like, uh, and I can tilt my screen forward like a little bit though, so it look everything looks a little bit darker. Let's try. I got but, I got one more blue. This might determine. <laughs> so I'm going to do the chart at the bottom of the page. Well, look at that. X and Y. That's great. And the rate. I know. Um, I don't know because it's pretty warm here today. So I'm going to use up all the ink right now for the chart that you guys already have. This one is nice. I'm going to have to get permission to go on campus so I can get a whole bunch of pens. I'm going to have to do this one more time. All right, 32, 32, 64. All right, we're gonna do the rate law. So, first, equation, first set of data is like our baseline. The second set of data, I didn't change Y, but I tripled X. All right, so no change in Y, but X triples. Oh, but look what happened over here. Nothing happened. There's no change. So that means X, is zero order, it has no effect. All right, so what that means is it doesn't matter what happened to X. When I go, I can compare the first to the third or the second to the third. Because it doesn't matter what happened with X because it's zero order. So when I doubled Y, I doubled the rate. So Y is first order. So we say that the equation is zero order for x and first order for y. Um, all right. So the rate law is rate equals k times y. You can again say it's the first power or you just write that. 
And then it wants us to solve for K, so we'll go ahead and do it. Uh, just so I show you the units. You can plug in any set of data. I'm just going to use the first set of data. And I want to go ahead and do this because the units are always a question. So molarity per second equals K, and then my Y is 0.1 molarity. So we would divide by the 0.1. We can ignore the X again because it's zero order. So that means it has no effect. Um, so all that happens here is my molarity cancels. And because the molarity canceled, um, this is going to be 320. And it's just going to be per second or seconds to the minus one. And so that's the value of K. Oh, yeah, right. And then I could ask you a whole bunch of other questions about it, but I don't need to worry about that. All right, two pages down. Any questions? I'm gonna erase this one. We're going to do, let me erase this one too. Because I logically walk that way. Um, so first order is by and far the most common. Again, nuclear decay is first order. So that's why we end with nuclear chemistry. And so the way you would write the equation, which is shown there, but you're not going to be asked to do it this way. That means the change in A over time. So A um, at some time, what this would mean is A at some time point minus A sub initial or zero, which is at the initial time. Um, and that equals the rate law is K times A. And if you had calculus, you do your fancy calculus um, integration, and you get that's a natural log relationship. So when you learn in calculus and like in, in uh, pre-calculus, when you learn about natural logs, you actually learn this equation because it's the biggest use, one of the biggest uses of natural logs. Um, so. The brackets are for the concentration. I use the A because I think that's how I learned it. Um, it just means whatever you're talking about. Uh, so it could be uranium. It could be an antibiotic um, and equals negative KT. There's a reason that chemists write it this way. Um, the opposite of a natural log is e to the power. So we're going to do a little bit of math with this, but what it is is zero order decay would be linear decay, which is the one picture there. Um, but first order decay means as it's decreasing, it curves. And so it makes a natural log type, um, it has a natural log type relationship. All right. And so normally I would say it's, it's in a box. You need to have it memorized. For you guys, that just needs to be on your card that you're gonna use, but you use it enough. So let's just solve these problems and move on. So number one, it tells us it's first order decay and it gives you that K is 0 0.0085. And again, the units just go with them. That means per S is seconds. So then it tells you the pressure initial is 240 torr. And it tells you you've gone five minutes. So that's the time. And it wants to know the pressure final at that time. So P sub T. Um, so you can use A's or P's, but basically we're solving for the numerator here. A handful of you have calculators where you just will put everything in there. Um, the thing that is really cool with first order decay and why it makes it really easy math. This is a ratio. It is the natural log of this ratio. 
which means you can use any units as long as they're the same because it's a ratio. That's only true for first order decay, but we don't have to do any math to change the TOR to ATMs to molarity. We just keep it as TOR. So this P initial is the same as P sub zero at zero time. So that's initial or at time zero. Zero seconds, zero minutes, zero hours, zero years, zero life, whatever. Um, what I want to do is the rearranging. So some of you are really good at this, but we would have the natural log, and I'm just going to call it P, T, that's our unknown, over P sub zero, which would be our 240 tour, equals negative. That negative is important. It's decay. We're doing decay, so you need the negative. Uh, point zero zero eight five which is per second. Units are really important. So I always get this reputation from all the other teachers that I'm a stickler for units. If you didn't show the unit here, you would probably just plug the five in and you would get it wrong because that five is not gonna be in complementary units. You have to change the five minutes to seconds. Pretty sure you can all do that in your head. And if not, I'll give you some theory dust. And five minutes times 60 seconds a minute is um, 300 seconds. All right. Again, some of you know how to do this, but we have to isolate the PT. So we have to get rid of the natural log. And this where it works really well for some of you because you're like, oh, I know natural logs. The opposite of a natural log is the little e. So on your calculator, natural log and little e are always the same button because they complement each other. So like adding and subtracting complement each other, um, natural log and little e, not capital E, little e. Um, and that you have to do that to both sides. So it's little e to that power. This e cancels the natural log. And again, I know about half of you are brilliant at this. And so you can just be punching it in, and then this would be e to the negative 0 0.0085. The seconds are going to cancel times 300. Um, and so you do e to that to the negative of that, and then that answer you would multiply by the 240 tor, and you would get my answer. And the answer makes sense at this point, because we don't have a lot of information, because it is decay, so your answer should be much less than the initial, because it's gonna decrease. So we should see that it decreases. Um, we'll try the second one here. If anybody has questions, you'll stop me. I have a question. Go ahead. So, um... Why is it three sig figs? Because like 0 0.0085 is two sig figs? Right? Oh, that's a good question. I have no idea. And even the five minutes, um, I do actually know why. So um, it, the answer actually has one sig fig. <laughs> do you really want to go there? Um, so when you do a function, it's a different sig fig rule and it becomes a place value. Um, the place value is the number of sig figs you're allowed. So the five minutes technically limits us to one sig fig, so we can go one place value. Um, so this is why in physics, one of the first things you learn is we're just gonna do everything with three sig figs. Um, but it is a different sig fig rule than we've ever learned, and so, um, this technically has one sig fig. Do you like that rule? <laughs> you can just go with the three sig fig rule and just give, whenever we're doing functions, just give your answer three sig figs. All right, okay. Um, if you gave it two, if you said 19 tour, I would be okay with that. Um, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and do this. Second one here.
just to make sure for math things. Um, it says, all right, so we must be using the initial pressure from the top one um, because I don't give another initial pressure and it's a part A, part B. So we're still going with the 240 tour. It's telling you the P at some time point is now 1.5 tour. And this time we're solving for time. So here's our formula. This time we don't have to use the E, we would just do our ratio. It is always final over initial. And again, you can do this as an, you can do it as final over initial or at time versus zero time equals negative K, which was 0 0.0085. Uh, per seconds and then times t. So you would natural log this ratio inside, right? Just put it in like that. And then we would divide by negative 0 0.0085. The tors cancel, so you can ignore them. They just have to be the same unit. You're going to get a number, you're going to get 600. A comment I will make to you. Somebody said, hey, Dr. Sherpa, when do we take a break? And I say, in 600 seconds, you would look at me like that lady is totally weird. She's dressed up like Tinkerbell and, right, because I'm trying to get fairy magic that the campus will eventually open. But um, do change your answer to the unit of time that would make most sense. So this would be 10 minutes. And then you may have noticed that I like to ask the question, does the answer make sense? This is assuming you have part A and B here. So on part A at five minutes, we were at 18.7. Tour, this was at five minutes. And so now at 10 minutes, we're at even less. So yeah, it should be longer time because we went less. We, we kept decreasing, we decayed or decomposed or decayed, whatever's going on here even more. All right. Questions. Some people have asked me why I use the squid hat. It is the only thing that erases this board in my house. So go ahead, Edward. He's good. All right. So question number two talks about half-life. And you guys have an advantage that I know all the questions I get asked. So even though everybody's not here, um, the symbol for half-life is a T and then a sub one half. So that's the symbol. And it, it's confused students for years and years. Um, so like Ryan, Portland Ryan was saying today, um, it, you do, when you're in class, you sometimes don't pay attention because you get tired. I have the exact same thing, and so you miss pieces. Um, and so that's one of the things that's nice with this. You can watch this whenever you have the time. All right, so in this problem, the fact that it's first order decay is important. What this is, this is the time for half of the sample to decay. So if we go back to this formula, if you started with say just one, it could be one milligram, it can be one millicurie, it could be one tor, it could be one molarity, it doesn't matter what the unit is, then at the half-life, you would be at one half, right? So that's what it's saying. So if your initial concentration is one, then at the half-life, you're at half of that. Um, and so that equals negative K, times t one half. Of course, if you divide anything by one, it's still the same thing. So we just write it as natural log of one half equals negative k t one half. And again, this is a symbol. This is just a subscript. Um, the half is factored in there. So what this means is if you know the half-life, you can find k. So I'm going to do this in two steps. So step one is going to be this formula. And by the way, I, you've heard me mention this for the past eight weeks. Um, you do have to 
state the formula as you're using it, um, which is one of the things I've noticed you've all been really good at doing. Um, I think because you see my answer keys and you see that I set it up in a linear way. All right, um, so we're gonna punch in natural log of one half. For those of you who read the book, they don't do it this way. They actually, I forget what this number is, like 0.673 or something. I, I have no idea. Um, but, and then that would equal negative K and then the half-life was 12.7 hours. Uh, you do not need to change the time to seconds. Just use, because we don't have a value for K yet, we'll just keep it in hours. And so we would just rearrange. So we're gonna divide by negative 12.70 hours, and we would get our K value, which is there. And 0.0545. That one half is an exact. So I have no idea why this has three sig figs. I think I was going with my three sig fig rule at this point. Um, but yeah, when we do concentration stuff, and that was a great question because um, with molarity and stuff, we want to really respect sig figs. But it looks like on this page, I was probably really tired and I just went to three sig figs, but then I didn't. All right. Um, that's what my value of K is. So then I can come over here and do step two. So this will be step two. So you state your formula and then we plug in what we know. So we have natural log, all right. It wants to know time. Oh no, I'm sorry, it wants to know what percent is left after 64 hours. If you're doing percent, so the initial, you either do that we're finding the final, and you do the initial is 100, because it's a percent, um, and about half of you will do it that way, or you just do the initial as one, and then when you solve, you just move your decimal place to. It, it really depends who taught you percents back when you were eight or 10 years old. Um, so how you think about this. So for most of you, um, so the initial percent, so initial it's at 100%. Same if it asks what fraction is left, you would say, well, initially I have a fraction of one because Initially, it's all there. It's before it started to decay. All right, that's going to equal negative. So another quick comment. Always show your unit. This is per hour. And then my time is 64 hours, so I don't have to do anything. Um, my hours, will, these have to complement. It's my big word. So I've been talking about DNA, so we talk about complementing, which would be like, oh, wow, Edward. Your hair looks amazing today, right? We're supposed to compliment each other. Um, oh shoot, I don't know what I was gonna say. All right, this would be one again where you do the E function to both sides. Oops. Natural log cancels, you rearrange. There is a negative here. I know what I was gonna say. K is always positive. It's like a cat eye on. Always positive. It's a good motto. Um, you're going through decay, so things are going to decline. So if you ever punch your numbers in and you end up with a higher number, it means you forgot your negative in the formula. But you would punch it in and we get 3.05% is left over. And again, I'm just for time. I'll leave it for you guys to go back and you can punch them in. I know my answers are good because I've used this one long enough. Um, you are gonna be asked, does the answer make sense? And of course it does, because your teacher did it. Um, the reason it makes sense was if you had 100%, the first half-life, you would now be at 50%. And the half-life was 12.7 hours. 
And then the next half-life, you would be at half of that. So that's what a half-life is. It keeps cutting in half. And that's how nuclear decay works, which we'll talk about next week. So when I used to work in, in graduate school, we'd have to wait until it went through three half-lives. So the next half-life. So it would keep cutting in half and cutting in half. So half-life for this problem, everything has a very specific half-life. The half-life was 12.7 hours, and we went 64 hours. So this is about five half-lives. So we should have cut it in half quite a bit. So since it went through five half-lives, there should be very little left. So that's what I would say. So we went through roughly, if I did my math right, So we'd go down 25, we'd end up at 12.5, 6.25. So, right. So roughly 3% would be about right. Or you could just say very little would be remain. If it only went through two half lives, we should be around 25%. Um, if it hadn't even made it to a half-life, let's say we only went for five hours. So it should be like most of it's left. It is not a linear decay. So most people get the explanation wrong because they think, oh, it should go through linear decay. Again, it's a, a natural log decay. So it starts, it hits that point where it's the whole thing with viruses. There's no actual number zero. You guys ever heard that? There's actually no zero. There is infinity, but there is no zero. And that's what natural log functions show you. You can approach it, you can get really close, but you can never actually get there. All right, three pages down. Go for it, what's your question? I'm wondering, um, so when we get 3.05, um, when I go down and down the half-life, it ends up at 3.125? That's because this is not, this was not exactly five half-lives. I see. Okay. If you took 12, oh, I see. If you took the 12.7 and multiplied by five, you would not get 64. That it's just rough. Yeah. That's why I said roughly. So that's actually a really great question for everybody watching. Um, this is just an approximation. And right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. We're gonna do one more page today. And any other questions? You can start racing. And that, that is temperature. So we've been dog sitting since Friday, since Thursday. And there's a dog I know, and it's like my dog, and this dog has like doubled in size since I saw him a year ago. And I was horrified. As soon as he came over and he jumped on my bed, because it was Thursday night after class, I'm like, Milo, what happened? Like he was, he was like just this big round, I couldn't believe he could jump on the bed. Um, but we've been fasting the dog for four days. So the dog doesn't like any of my food because I don't have meat in my house. Um, and so, but he eats tofu, it turns out. He, he loves tofu. It apparently tastes like chicken to him. All right. Um, the dog has so much fat, he's living off of it, no problem. And in nature, wolves and coyotes and other canines fast for a while. So we've decided um, we have to have a talk with the owner about what kind of dog food and they give him unlimited food. So we're going to look at temperature. I was thinking that because I can hear him right outside the door. He's very attached to me. He keeps thinking that I'll feed him food, I think. All right, so it tells you temperature has an effect. I talked about that at the beginning because more jiggles, more giggles. So you increase the jiggles, the giggles, the wiggles, all that stuff. So you have to jiggle and giggle. Um, and so, which is kinetic energy. And so you have more collisions, so more, more frequent and more force of the collision. Let's write it that way. More frequent and more forceful collisions. All 
And then there's just a little thing there. So the picture, for those of you looking on, is a Svante Erison. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know how to say his name, really. Um, and those of you taking summer 223, you're going to pick a famous chemist. So he's a famous chemist. He won a Nobel Prize. And he figured out, he came up with the idea of activation energy. And he also proposed, like 130 years ago, uh, that CO2 is going to cause global warming. And yeah, anyway. He got his Nobel Prize for his PhD work uh, 20 years after that. But uh, this was that graph we drew earlier. So that's the rock that you have to get the rock over the hill to get it going. Uh, and so his equation is shown there. We're going to do it how it is shown below, but you don't have to write this out. We, we're not going to use this equation because A is, um, we're not going to define it. But K is the rate constant, which is either given to you or you're going to solve for it. E sub A is the activation energy. So that's what the third Nobel Prize in chemistry was for. So it's capital E is always for energy, and then the little a is for activation. So again, that was that energy to get the reaction going. So we have to get it up over the hill. Um, so once it gets going, it keeps, it, it rolls down the hill, but we have to get it started. Um, so R is the other R. So it's not the one that we used with ATMs. And that is because the units for energy are kilojoules or joules. So the R we're going to use is 8.314. Um, I don't like this number. I like that's in joules. So this would be joules. I like to use kilojoules. You may or may not have noticed that from when we worked with liquids. So I change it to um, 8.314 eats an eight of three kilojoules per mole K. So the denominator is still the same. Um, and if you're really curious, I mean, I could show you in the office hours. Um, it's actually the same number as the 0 0.082057 ATM liters per mole K. Um, it has to do with what a kilojoule is and then the conversion between them. But this is the R you use when you're involved with energy. The homework that we had tonight, the worksheet, used ATMs because it was osmotic pressure, so we used the other R. Uh, let's see, what other numbers? R, T. T is going to be Kelvin temperature because of the K, the Kelvin there. And A we're not going to use. A is a collision factor. It is different for every time you do it or some every equation and it um anyway there we go so a quick comment about activation energy the only thing that can change it is a catalyst so Temperature helps because you get jiggles and giggles, so you help get it up there. Um, but a catalyst will actually make the activation energy lower. So you actually, it's, it's like climbing a hill, so you don't have to go over the whole hill anymore. Um, and that's something we'll talk about. Uh, if this is rearranged, you can make it into a linear regression equation. And we might do that Thursday night if we have time. Um, but we're gonna do it algebraically tonight. So we used to do a second kinetics lab and you guys would actually do a graph with it. So you're gonna to get to do that with the lab at home. Um, so I'll go through that in the next one and also in the lab. But, right. So if we take this formula and we do some fancy magic, and if you're really geeky with math, like I am, you can play with the magic 
of how to rearrange it, but you would do to get rid of this is this little e that's that little e function. If you do a natural log to both sides, you get that. Um, and so, how did I write it here? I did the twos. So these are little k's. That is a ratio. Uh, is equal to negative. This is. So back in the old days, when you used to have to take your test without notes, this would be the one of, that most students had to come up for one point and ask for the formula. Um, that one point doesn't really make a difference. You might as well have the formula. You have to be able to use it. So we're going to look at it tonight, and we'll look at it again on Thursday. And yeah. All right. So that's the formula. So we'll state the formula and we'll go ahead and calculate and it gives us numbers. It tells us, right, k is, I just have to write it down, so I have to keep looking, 0 0.101. Uh, and again, the units on k just go with them. And this is at 25, so if I call that k1, then my t1 is 25 degrees Celsius. You guys remember how to change the Kelvin? You add 273. So this is 298 Kelvin. So anytime you use R, any R's, when you take um, physics, you'll use a uh, different R because you'll, you'll be in kilopascals most likely. All right, and then my K2 is 0.332. And this is at a higher temperature. So we're at 45 degrees. So. You can make a little list or you can label it on the thing, on this piece of paper. So this is what, 318 Kelvin. All right, so we would plug in and rearrange and um, you don't have to do anything with the little e. So you would do natural log of this ratio um, and then we would bring this piece over Right, so I would actually, for some of you, you're gonna be able to do the math no problem. For some of you, you, you would wanna punch that in and then bring it over by dividing, and then you'll multiply by the R, and I wanna point out there is a negative there. Activation energy is always positive. Isn't this awesome? We have so much positivity tonight. So it's always positive. That's because Tinkerbell's here to make everything go faster with her fairy dust. So uh, if you get a negative, it's because you just forgot about that negative there. Um, I want to go through B because I think you guys can solve, but I, again, like the R that's in kilojoules. So my answer, because activation energies are always really large numbers and you would punch it in. It's just algebra. Um, and I guess if you have trouble with it, you can always, we'll do more of these on Thursday. I want to do B though. Um, so we're going to use the answer for A to do B. B says, all right, we have a new temperature and it's now 35 degrees Celsius. So what's my new K value? You can use either set of these. I am going to use the first set of data. So we're just going to erase the second set of data. So I would tell you when doing the homework also or doing things when there's a part A, B, C, D, you're going to use your information from the step before. So now I'm going to call this my T2 and my K2. And so this is 308 K. And we're going to use this activation energy. So I want to go through solving this. We'll plug in here, natural log. So K2 is what I'm solving for. That's why I'd like to solve for the one that's in the numerator. I'm gonna use K1.101. You can just write your units really small so they don't confuse you. And then negative, because it's in the formula, this is kilojoules per mole. Um, Again, I like to do it in kilojoules, so I use this E. I'm sorry, this R, 8.314, E to negative 3. 
Um, back when we did gas laws, I told you you could just write R. You can do that again, but please be careful to make sure you use the correct R. So you can just write the variable R in there. All right, and then make sure you plug them in. That's why the list is really nice. So we're doing T2 first, and then minus one over T1. So I recommend for all of you that you do actually try this problem on your own to make sure you can do the algebra. So if you're having trouble with it, you can ask me. Um, you know, you guys are probably the only ones who are gonna watch this before, so the three of you will probably be the only ones. I, I will actually post the next homework set, or you can like do these, these questions. Um, yeah, that's a disadvantage. Just, this homework set is, kinetics is really um, simple, except it's very different from everything else we've done. Um, and so, but I think because you guys have the notes, and I actually redid the notes because of our situation where you don't really have much contact with me or tutors. All right, so just a reminder for those of you following along at home, is if you take e to the power of both sides, that will get rid of the natural log. So it's gonna be e to the power of that whole thing. And then once you get that whole answer, you'll multiply by 0 0.101 and you get a K, and my answer is correct, that we find that K2 is 0.184. Whatever K1 units were, you use that, N to the minus one, S to the minus one, and as promised, I will ask the question, does your answer make sense? And it goes back to what I erased. T2, we increase the temperature, it increases the rate, because you get more jiggles, blah, 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 all that stuff. If you increase the rate, that means the K value has changed. That is what temperature does. So the first two pages we did tonight was concentration. K is a constant as long as the temperature does not change. And once you change the temperature, the rate constant will change. The catalyst changes the activation energy. And that's, that's all she had. So questions. Oh, good. You did that in like oh, an hour. That was phenomenal. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I was wondering, um, is it what's it, uh, negative 47 kilojoules per what? I can't. Oh, um, per mole. That. Per mole, okay. Per mole. Yeah, so actually, I thank see. you. The units for activation energy are always joules or kilojoules per mole. Oh, and it's written on the. Oh, shoot, it's written right there. You're okay. <laughs> it's already written for me. Actually, <laughs> that's actually really good for you to point that out, Erin, because, um, yeah. And I'm pretty certain all my stuff is good. Anybody else questions before I end? And is it this, Go ahead. And is it uh, kilojoules per mole underneath that? Uh, 8.314 E negative 3 kilojoules per mole K? Is that? Wait, what one are you asking me? Oh, yeah, this is, oh, it's, cool. this is right here. Kilojoules per mole K. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, the R value. Good. So, yeah, when we're doing kinetics, the R we're using, capital R, is a different, a new one. Yeah. Hey, all right. Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions? If not, I'm going to stop my recording.